what a pleasure to be with you again. This is the third in a short series of our civilizational moment, responding faithfully as followers of Jesus. Midnight on Tuesday, May the 8th, 1945, was what the Germans call Stunde Null or Zero Hour. Hitler had died and the new Germany had begun. It was the moment they said where they had to start all over again, or in our current jargon, they had a massive national reset. Now that's actually often said in history, and there are a greater and smaller sense of the sense of zero hour. Sometimes the stress is on, thank God for the new, the old was a nightmare, or actually the old wasn't so bad, and we hope the new is really rather more like it than we thought. You can see at the end of World War II, there was something of the same thing for Christian thinkers. World War II saw an incredible burst of Christian thinking. On the continent of Europe, people like Jacques Maritain, Simone Weil, Jacques Ellul, and many others. And in the English-speaking world, famous writers like T.S. Eliot, W.H. Auden, and of course, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. And during the war, they wrote massive amount of good stuff about humanity, education, democracy, all sorts of things. But as historians said sadly at the end of the war, it didn't amount to very much. Now, our Western world and certainly much of the American world has a sense today of a reset, a starting all over, a zero hour, following various things and supremely the global pandemic. And if we're thinking of spiritual things and matters of faith, you can see on the one hand, with greater clarity, the emergence of hostile anti-Christian forces in our culture. And on the other hand, if we look at the church and certainly many parts of evangelicalism, you can see uncertainty division, scandal, defections, and people giving up the faith and moving off. And there's no question this is a solemn moment for the West, for America, and for the Christian church in the West. So let me try and describe some of the challenges that I see that we face in 2021 and 2022, as we move into the next few years. Now, I'm not looking at things in terms of politics or economics and things like that, which we could easily do, but rather in terms of the challenges to our faith in Jesus. Now, for 200 years in serious circles, there was the dominance of what was called the secularization theory. Put simply, as the world got more modern, it would get less religious and religion would disappear. Now that collapsed after the Iranian revolution and things like that. But you can see that it's long been believed that some of the greatest questions facing humanity had a bearing on religion. And this has been around for a while. For example, one question was, would Islam modernize peacefully? Most Muslims who are in a minority situation, say in the West, are peaceful. Although we know much of the violence you see in the world does come from radical Islam. And the question for them has long been, would they come to accept freedom of conscience and religious liberty, which would change everything? A second big question long recognized is which faith would replace Marxism in China. 
there was a famous meeting of the Chinese Academy, which put the question exactly like that. And they discussed, would Marxism be replaced by nationalism or by Confucianism or by Buddhism? Or in 20 years time, could it be the Christian faith with the majority faith? Now we can see that since that conference, Xi Jinping has led China in a nationalist direction. And yet the church is growing all the time. And the outcome of that question in the decades ahead will be incredibly important for the church, of course, but also for the entire world. The third great question long seen was, would the West sever, cut off, or recover its roots? The West owes a lot to the Greeks and a considerable amount to the Romans, but the principal source of what made the West the West is the Bible and the Gospel. And yet, starting in Europe and now increasingly across almost all the English-speaking world, the cutting off. So the West today is a cut flower civilization. Now, those questions have been around for a long time, but I want to bring it up to date with where we are now, because we can see things much more deeper. First, appreciate America's color revolution. The post-Soviet world had a whole series of so-called color revolutions, like the Orange Revolution in the Ukraine and the Purple Revolution in Iran and so on. But I'm thinking at a much deeper level. The red wave, the black wave, and the rainbow wave. What do I mean? The red wave. The world is challenged by two forms of Marxism. The obvious one in China, classical Marxism, totalitarianism. That's not our problem. The other one is cultural Marxism, and that's different. More of that in the next talk. But you can see that's what's having tremendous inroads into America. And now we can see that red wave is extremely powerful in education and many other parts of the world. How about the black wave? The Middle East is reeling and two questions are being asked. What happened? And why didn't do it, someone do something about it to stop it? What they mean is it all went back to the year 1979. The Iranian revolution, the attack on the mosque in Mecca, and the invasion of Afghanistan. And those three events set off the rise of Iran as a Shia power and Saudi Arabia as the Sunni power and between them creating radicalisms all across the world. Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, and you could go on down the line. We are now facing a series of radicalisms and we remember that not only do they talk about the little Satan, which is Israel, but they talk about the great Satan, which is America. And we can see that with the fall of Afghanistan this week to the Taliban, how that significance of the black wave is exceedingly powerful and not over by any means. How about the third one, the rainbow wave? Anyone who understands the sexual revolution and the LGBTQ plus revolution knows that it goes back to the same place in Paris from which the political revolution in 1789 came, the Palais Royal. And the architects like the Marquis de Sade or later people like Wilhelm Reich are quite clear about what they're doing. As Reich says, we have two great enemies, parents, which is why we want sex education at three and four to sideline parents, and the church, because the sexual revolution is deliberately an attempt 
to overthrow, as they put it, 3,000 years of civilization and bring in a new world. So currently people are talking about things like transgenderism, as if somehow this has sprung up all of a sudden. But yeah, you can read people like H.G. Wells writing back in World War I, predicting transgenderism in the name of setting the world free by his lights. And you can see how radical they were then. Now, put those three revolutions together, the red, the black, and the rainbow coalition, and you can see that the enemy is without and the enemy is within. And much of the church, sadly, doesn't understand so much of it. And in certain areas, you can see some of them have drunk the Kool-Aid. But move on to a second big factor. We need to understand our contribution to our own rejection. There have always been atheists, but modern secularism is absolutely unprecedented in history, growing up in Europe and now sweeping much of the known world. And we, if we look at it, we can see secularism is both a parasite on our best they believe all that we believe without God. And it's a protest against our worst. So if you look at the impulses behind secularism, you can see three that are very, very important. And they're all basically spiritual. First, part of secularism says we don't want God. You can see this in the French Revolution and in radical Marxism. For example, the cry of Diderot, picked up by the Jacobin, the radicals in the streets, we will never be free until we strangle the last king with the guts of the last priest. In other words, church and state were in collusion, both oppressive, so the revolution threw off both. And the radical left has had a hostility to the Christian faith that's militant ever since. Solzhenitsyn used to say that hostility to the faith is more central to Marxism and the radical left than either politics or economics. And we need to understand that is a spiritual animosity. The second impulse, not we don't want God, but we don't need God. Particularly with all the advances economically, technologically, you can see we're prosperous and luxurious and so on. People can live as if they don't need God. The third impulse, we can replace God with biogenetics and so on. You can see a book like Yuval Harari, Homo Deus, which is Latin for man as God. Here he is as an atheist who is a Jew writing from Jerusalem. And yet he has the nerve to say science can do far better than the Old Testament God in creating. We can replace God. Now, put those three together. We don't want God. We don't need God. And we can replace God. And you have the rise of secularism, progressivism, rationalism, scientism, elite, and you've gone down the line. These are not just ideas. These are more than ideologies. I would suggest they are principalities and powers, and they can only be taken on by spiritual warfare with Christ the victor overcoming them. But we've got to say with humility, because we have helped to create our own rejection and our greatest opposition. Now, Americans can say, well, of course, a lot of that was European, the corruption of the church that was established. That's true. And with the First Amendment in America, religion was disestablished and there was never a powerful revulsion and reaction to faith as there was in Europe. And yet with some of the extremes of the religious right in the recent decades, you can see an American-style reaction, even a revulsion against faith 
that you've had for a long time in Europe. And so we've got to approach this with great humility, recognizing what we're up against and knowing that can only be fought with the weapons of the spirit. A third point. We need to follow the devastation of what's called cultural climate change. A lot of people are talking about climate change. Hardly anyone's talking about cultural climate change, but actually those who are point out that it will be even more devastating than climate change. What do I mean? We haven't time to go into depth, but you put together three things. What's called philosophical cynicism, moral corruption, and social collapse. Cynicism. If you look at thinking in the Western world, particularly in the last 50 years, the confidence in truth or objective reality or moral knowledge has collapsed. God is dead, they say. Truth is dead, they say. Everything's only power. Nothing is decidable. Everything's relative. Everything is uncertain. Now, it's in devastating. Where you have high truth, you can have high trust. And where you have high trust, you can have high freedom. But if there's no truth and no trust and everything's power, everything's a matter of the power conflict and suspicion and so on and so on. And you can see how devastating this is. You cannot have freedom on the basis of our modern views of truth and thinking. And that, of course, affects the moral corruption and eventually the social collapse. Because the binding, the bonding, the gluing has gone. And you can see families and communities and now whole societies are unraveling. So the harvest of chaos and confusion in the next generation and then in our grandchildren's generation will be absolutely extraordinary. A fourth point, we need to wrestle with the distortions of modernity. What do I mean? A lot of Christians think that the only challenges we face are from ideas, bad ideas, such relativism or secularism, thing. Those are damaging, no question. But we need to see that our modern world itself is shapes us in ways that we're often not aware of. And that can be equally damaging, not either or, but both and. Let me give some examples. Modernity has done more damage to the church, it said, than all the persecutors in history put together. Which is why the church is exploding in many parts of the world, but not in the advanced modern world. But let me give you the examples. Take the way the church has shifted from authority to preference. We should be people under authority. Jesus is Lord. He put his stamp on the scriptures, the Bible, as his word. We should be under authority. But in the modern world, we're living, for example, in a consumer culture. And the essence of consumerism is choice, endless choice, and therefore preference. Everything's a matter of what you want now, what you prefer, what you choose, and so on. Now, that doesn't matter, say, if we're choosing Cereals in a supermarket, you might have a hundred to choose from. Whether you choose this or that doesn't really matter at all as long as it's healthy. But when you shift up to relationships and then shift to faith and church going and Bible reading, it matters. So you have people who read the New Testament, but not the Old, or much of the Old, but not Leviticus. Or as one man said to me, I want a lot of love on my plate, but as he said, Hell? Hell no! And you can see that a lot of modern Christians, they pick and choose. 
the church of their choice, the sermon of their choice, the music of their choice. Everything is what we choose and what we prefer. And you can see the Western church has lost authority because everything's a matter of what we prefer or don't prefer. Or take a second example. We've shifted from integration to fragmentation. If Jesus is Lord, he's Lord over everyone, everywhere, in everything, as I said in terms of calling earlier. But in our modern world, it's, the world is so big, we're fragmented and strung out. Take my wife, Jenny, comes from Los Angeles, a sprawling metropolis loosely held together by cars and freeways. And it was in the 1960s in L.A. that the comment was made famously that the Christian faith has become privately engaging, publicly relevant. It thrives here, but not there. At one stage, we were in a church where President Reagan went and I was teaching an adult class. And I asked many of them how far they drove to church and to work and so on. Many of them drove 75 miles to church say 50 miles on Monday to work, another 50 or 100 to the beach or to a sports game or whatever. And you can see their lives were just strung out in that way. And the same would be true in London or Tokyo or many of the cities of our world. And the net effect is a fragmentation of the faith rather than an integration. Or take one that's very obvious to all of you who are members of the Global Awakening. The modern world shifts us from a supernatural worldview to a secular worldview. In the traditional world, both for Christians and pagans, the unseen was not unreal. In fact, the unseen was more real than the seen. And people understood things like business and sex and very practical things in terms of the unseen world. But the essence of modernity is that what is unseen is unreal. As my mentor Peter Berger puts it, we live in a world without windows. What's the real world? The world of business and science and technology. It's what you can see, touch, taste, weigh, calculate, measure. We talk about measurable outcomes. That's the real world. Not at all. Think of Elisha's servant who couldn't see anything but the enemy army outside. And Elisha prayed that his eyes would be opened and he saw the chariots of fire. Our world by and large has been secularized in awareness. So there are many, many Western Christians who are functional atheists. They're hardly different from their neighbors next door. They believe and talk about heaven and prayer and supernatural. But compared with the Korean Christians or the African Christians or Christians in Latin America, they're as secular as their secular neighbors. And I thank the Lord for global awakening and all that you're doing. But most of our fellow Christians have been far more secularized than they think. Now, what do we need to combat this? First, very obviously, and I needn't stress this because it's what you're all about. We need prayer and spiritual warfare against the forces of darkness that are all around us. But secondly, and I'll say a bit more about this because it's not so common, we need an analysis of culture. We're in the world, but not of the world. To resist the world, we've got to recognize it and have people who really try and read the signs of the times and know what are the pressures coming down on us and so on. Let me give you a simple example. We're living in America, in the West, in the modern world, in the middle of what's called fast life. We all know it. 24-7 pressure. Where did it come from? It didn't come from any philosopher or sociologist or psychologist. It didn't come from any thinker at all. It came from 
clocks and watches. Historians say that the clock, probably the most powerful European invention. Of course, it was invented around 1300, and it wasn't all that influential when it was first invented. But then in the 19th century, through railways and so on, whole continents were coordinated with the same time, and now we have atomic time, and nanoseconds matter. And you can see we're living in the modern world with fast life. Now, it not only affects time, it affects things like psychology. We talk about being on the right side of history. We talk about being relevant. We think the latest is greatest. Now, it has nothing to do with mechanics of a clock, but it's the way the clock has put its stamp on all of us. And so we're catching up, racing to catch up and so on. Now, we need to understand that because the biblical way is very different. A Christian bestseller a few years ago actually wrote, in the modern world, the audience, not the message, is sovereign. Because we need to be relevant, seeker-sensitive, audience-driven. Now that, of course, is nonsense. The message, the word, the Lord, the spirit is sovereign not the audience. Yes, we're all things to all people to win them to Christ. So we're sensitive, we're aware of our audiences. My parents are missionaries. They had to make the gospel Chinese to the Chinese and so on. Yes, we're aware of audiences, but the message is sovereign, not the audience. And you can see how much of the American and the Western church is more shaped by the culture and by the world than it is by the word. So we're living in a momentous times, but let me finish with more points of hope. One great thing that happens in moments of civilizational crisis is that the false identifications are broken down. Take the collapse of Rome. Two generations earlier, Rome had been persecuting the church. But when Rome declared itself officially Christians, Christians baptized Rome, and they thought that as Rome spread, so the kingdom would spread. And then Rome collapsed. Thank God. The kingdom didn't collapse. Rome collapsed. But their identification of the kingdom and Rome had to collapse, and they saw where their loyalties really were. And of course, that was the time you had creative new visions that I mentioned before. St. Augustine's great picture of the city of God and the city of man. And the reminder, cities like Rome or London or Paris or eventually Washington, these will pass. But the city of God endures. But one of the things I absolutely love, and I'll finish with this one, you can see in times of crisis, so what Reinhold Niebuhr put it, the end is never the end. There are two meanings of the word end in the Bible. Some are rather like our Latin word finis. In other words, end as ending, period, full stop, conclusion. And there's a lot of that in life. Things sadly don't last. Our lives don't last. We die. There ends like that. But the other meaning of the word end in the scripture is not finis, but telos, the Greek word which means climax, objective, goal, culmination, purpose. And the Lord always has his ends in the second sense, even if they're ends in the first sense. So many people today are looking around and they're discouraged. They see the end of this, the church is no longer a Christian consensus or whatever. No, no, we're living in the times we're living in. But we should know that whatever ends there are in one sense, the Lord has his endings in another sense and the kingdom will endure. 
I said earlier, I grew up in China. We moved from the north of China with war, famine, death, including the death of my two brothers, as I said, to Nanking, which I saw the beginning of the Chinese Revolution and the reign of terror. I well remember the day when my dad said to me, son, we're in trouble. Chiang Kai-shek has just abandoned the city and we're at the mercy of the Red Army. They came in, public trials in the morning, public executions in the afternoon. It was a terrible time. So my first 10 years, death, destruction, violence, decadence, disease, you name it. I never saw my parents with anything but a quiet trust in the Lord. And that's one thing I carried away from my, watching my parents in their lives. God is greater than all. God can be trusted in all situations. We should have faith in God. We should have no fear. We are living in a civilizational moment, but it's time for the people of God with confidence in Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit and courage to stand up and speak out and by God's grace in some way to redeem the time in which we're living. Again, thank you. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you like the content that you receive from this channel, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Also, give us a thumbs up and share our content with all of your friends and family. It really helps us out. We also invite you to consider partnering with us. We're a nonprofit ministry with a mission to awaken the world to the power of the gospel. If you'd like to help us continue creating content, consider giving at the link on the screen or text the word donation to 21,000. If you want even more of our spirit-filled content, consider a subscription to globalondemand.tv, our subscription video platform. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.